Hi, this is Jim Cunningham, and welcome to uh, our webinar here today, Build Back Better Tax Planning, possible 62.1% income tax rate, and this just does not apply solely to very wealthy people. We're also going to go through an end-of-year checklist, and these are very important topics. We have a lot of people on the webinar here today. If you have a question, go ahead and put that in the Q&A. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can go ahead and put a question in the comments, and we do look at those comments regularly. Obviously, this is a disclaimer. I'm a lawyer. I'm talking. This is not legal advice. Don't rely on this for <laughs> legal advice. That's a really bad idea, but this is really important for you uh, to just understand what's going on in the world, and you're not going to... I'm going to go over stuff that you don't always see on the news or always see online, uh, but these are some little hidden gotchas in here that frankly are very difficult to understand. So if you're watching this on YouTube, click subscribe to our YouTube page. It's very important. If you click subscribe, it'll pop up in your YouTube feed. And we have offices throughout California. We've got the Golden Gate Bridge in Southern California there. I'm the managing partner, Cunningham Legal. I have 25 years experience. We have, again, offices throughout California. I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust, and probate law, which means I'm a lawyer and I've taken an additional bar exam. I'm also a real estate broker, securities and insurance licensed, and a pilot. So we're going to cover today, is it really a 62.1% income tax bracket? Are you kidding me? Really, where did that come from? Well, that's combining state and federal and a bunch of other extra, um, you know, extra new taxes that are, that are on the horizon. We're going to cover our end of year checklist. We'll start with that. I'll spend a little bit of time on that. But really kind of what's happened is this Build Back Better um, Act has really kind of crowded out, in, at least in our law firm, crowded out a lot of other work. And so people are very, very concerned about this. You should be concerned about this. If you earn income or have assets, you need to be paying attention to this because it likely will affect you. So let's go cover the end of your checklist. These are just kind of some, you know, I would, I would chalk this up to basic estate hygiene, just making sure your stuff's in order. You know, when you leave this earth, it, you're not taking anything with you, okay? And if you get sick, uh, and people are caring for you, you got to deal with all your stuff and, and, you know, your physical, tangible assets. And people are going to have to deal with the finances and, you know, you if you're, if you're still um, with us. But I would recommend that you start with making a list of your assets and your stuff. And this is very important because, and, and I would start with like the stuff that's inside your house and outside your house. So this would be your home, your vacation home, your rental property, jewelry, collectibles, vehicles, arts, antiques, Computers and laptops is important because there's a lot of information on those, right? Uh, and which ones are using and which ones you're not using, right? Which ones are current, which ones aren't. Coins, firearms, um, you know, firearms are their own little uh, animal. Uh, they're, they have special regulation both federally and in each state. And just on a very high level, if you're looking at administering a state, an estate, whether someone's passed away or become incapacitated, uh, you can commit a whole host of inadvertent felonies. So if you come across firearms, don't handle them unless you can safely handle them. And I would recommend that you have all those transfers through a federal firearms licensee. There are some exemptions, but the, the laws are just so complicated, it's easier to go through the FFL. So uh, basically anything that can sprout legs and walk away, these would be gold bars, right? Uh, you wanna make sure that people know that you have this stuff. And with an estate plan, if you created an estate plan at Art Firm Cunningham Legal in 2012 or later, they're in your binder. There are some um, uh, personal property distributions, and that's actually the one part of your estate plan. It's toward the end of your estate plan. It's the one part where you can actually write in, you know, I want Johnny to get my lawnmower or whatever it is. Uh, you can go ahead and, and write that in there. And then I would also do a list of your non-physical assets. So these would be your investments, your 401k, your retirement plans, bank accounts, and your policies of insurance. Now, this is really, really important because, um, you know, many of our clients uh, every year, well, meant at some, there'll be a fire and they lose everything. I mean, some of, you know, we had a fire in Northern California, people barely got out with their lives and they leave all that behind. So it's important, you know, if something happens to know, hey, did mom and dad have insurance coverage or, or what was it? So very important to get all that stuff together and, um, and make a list of those non-physical assets. You know, who is the insurance um, broker or agent? Also create a list of debts. Now, Debts tend to be self-evident because you're going to get a monthly statement or maybe a quarterly statement or something like that. But also it's helpful to create a list of debts so that people know that, uh, so people know if, if you're not able to pay those bills, whether you passed away or become incapacitated, to know if those are real or not, okay? Because, you know, there's a lot of shady people out there, but also you want to make sure that your debts are paid because that is a job that your trustee and your, um, your, your, the people who are looking after you 
that's their responsibility to, to pay those from your assets. Also membership lists, um, you know, sometimes they have an accidental death and dismemberment policy. It's infrequent that there's a, an accidental death. I believe it's 6% of deaths are accidental, uh, but include the charitable organizations. And this really does help. I mean, this is kind of, you know, macabre, I guess, but it does help in writing the obituary. And I know that's something that when we meet with people after someone's passed away, it's something that some people struggle with. Uh, so it's helpful to your loved ones if you write that down and then make copies of your lists. You know, my wife uh, is a list maker and thank goodness I married someone who's a list maker because she has, a, sometimes she'll have a bunch of lists and then make a list of all of her lists. Okay. If that makes sense. Uh, but get these lists and, and give one to your spouse. Uh, one should be in your living trust binder, or if you don't have a binder, just, you know, put, put it with the rest of the documents and then one in a safe deposit box. That's just in case your, your stuff is, uh, you know, your house burns down or something. So, um, and then review your retirement account assets. Now this is super important folks. Something you need to know, retirement and insurance and annuities. You can write a will, you can write a living trust, but in the vast majority of cases, what you write down in your will or trust has nothing to do with who gets your retirement accounts and your insurance and your annuity. Let me say that again. What matters is who you name as beneficiary on the form that's with the company. So if you're at XYZ uh, Life Insurance Company, they don't care what your living trust says. They say, listen, this is a contract. You've given us money as the insured. We promise to pay that at your death to pay it to the people that you've told us to pay it to, right? So check in, look at that because, you know, you may have somebody on there that you don't want to receive that money. You may have someone on there that's deceased. Uh, or maybe, you know, what if that person passes away before you do and you don't have the opportunity to change your beneficiary designation? So again, this is mindfulness, but I would make sure that, that you, uh, you look into that because that is something very, very important and is often overlooked. Um, update your insurance. So we've had, you know, as I mentioned, we have offices in Northern and Southern California. And over the past few years, there have been several fires that have burned large swaths of land. Many of our clients have lost their home. This is just tragic when we get these calls. Uh, and here's what, here is the sad reality that people are finding. They haven't looked at their homeowner's insurance for 20 years. And they're finding that the cost of construction is Six hundred, seven, eight hundred dollars a square foot in Tahoe. It's over a thousand dollars a square foot, meaning you may have one hundred sixty dollars a square foot or two hundred on your insurance policy. So check your coverage. If you're ask your agent, hey, if my house burns to the ground, how much will I get? And then make sure that correlates with, you know, is that enough to rebuild the property or not? Because there's some really nasty tax consequences. And this is really important to understand. There are nasty tax tax consequences if you don't rebuild within two or four years. And there's different reasons why if one's de declared a, a natural disaster area or not. But you may not have the money to complete the project, right? So uh, that's very, very important. Uh, who are again? Who are the beneficiaries on your insurance? Life insurance. What about on life specifically? Life insurance. You know, many of our clients they have a paid up policy, uh, or or they're paying into a policy. And we had this client a few years ago who was paying $6,000 a year on a $600,000 uh, death benefit, and they had a $60,000 cash value, right? So they have this life insurance that pays $600,000 if they die, and they have this built-up cash value of $60,000. Well, these clients were able to work with an insurance professional uh, that we work with, and were able to eliminate the $6,000 premium, keep the $600,000 death benefit, have that guaranteed out to age 105 from 100. And so that saved the family $6,000 a year. Now, life insurance companies will not call you and say, hey, rates have gone down. Basically, what's happened is instead of people living 100 years, life insurance companies are like, wow, people are living longer. Let's, let's price these as if people live 105 years, which means the cost of the insurance goes down. So you frankly may be overpaying. If that's something you're interested in, reach out to us and we can certainly connect you with the right people. Check your POD or TOD designation. That is payable on death and transfer on death. Typically at a bank, you will see POD. That means pay on death. I put $100 in a bank account and I name Bob as my POD beneficiary. Bob gets that $100,000 when, when I die. If it's in a brokerage account, you know, at ABC Brokerage House, 
uh, typically they use the term TOD, which is transfer on death. They mean the same thing, okay? Uh, just different terms. But again, check those beneficiary designations because that trumps, right? And I'm talking about like playing cards, that trumps your living trust. So your living trust has, your trustee has only control over assets that are inside of the living trust. But if you have a living trust and a POD account, the, B, the POD, the payable on death beneficiary will receive that money. And that may be inconsistent with your, with your goals. Now, if you have no will or you have no living trust, I would highly recommend that you schedule a time to meet with a savvy lawyer, basically somebody who knows what they're doing, not a generalist. You really need to go with someone who, who focuses on this area to get your affairs in order. And the reason I say that, the reason you need to go to a savvy lawyer is if you don't have, a, if you don't have much money, many times that's when you need the expertise. So one of the catastrophic things that can happen in your life is needing long-term care. And that can wipe your savings out. It can wipe, you know, if you're married, and, and somebody gets sick, what about the other spouse? Does the sick spouse kind of go through all the assets? Well, what happens to the survivor? So uh, something you still need, if you don't have much assets, you need a savvy lawyer. If you have a lot of assets, well, obviously you need someone who knows what they're doing and they're not gonna cause your family to pay or to overpay on tax. If you do have a will or living trust, I recommend every year you look at it. Now, you need to look at it every year. And I would say every two to three years, um, I would, I would recommend a review. And again, review with the savvy lawyer. Some attorneys charge for the review, some don't. It just depends. Uh, and when you have a change, a life change review that, you know, death of a spouse, marriage of a child, divorce of a child, or your divorce, your divorce is a really, you know, a game changer, uh, births and deaths. And, you know, change happens, okay? And your wishes are likely to change uh, as the years go by. I would also suggest that you consider I'm not telling you to do it, that you consider sharing your estate plan with the people who will be the decision makers when you're not the decision maker. Now, what I mean by that is it's going to be typically your successor trustee or your executor. It's probably a good idea. Now, you need to talk to the, your lawyer, you know, whether you're our client or someone else's client, you should talk to the lawyer. Is this a good idea? Okay, because it might be a good idea. It might not be a good idea, but I would say at least have that as a consideration. And check in with your A-team. We'll talk a little bit more about what the A-team is. And, um, but the eight, the core A team, when it comes to estate planning is your lawyer, your financial advisor, and your CPA. That's really the three legs of the, the three-legged stool. And each one of these professionals, they overlap on their knowledge, uh, but they perform three fundamentally, fundamental separate core functions. And, uh, you know, sometimes you'll have people who are, have dual licensed. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a CPA. So I don't have that background. Some lawyers are a CPA, but I, I choose to stay in my lane and I practice law. That, that's, that's what I do. Yeah, I'm securities license and insurance license. Um, that's probably more curiosity than, than anything else. But we, at Cunningham Legal, we stay in our lane and we're, we're performing the core function that a lawyer would, would perform. Also, um, simplifying your finances. You know, it was said, the famous Italian uh, philosopher said, I would have written a longer letter, but I didn't have enough time uh, you know, it takes some thought to simplify and it takes some effort to simplify. In, in some sense, it's easier to have multiple accounts. And what I mean by this, if you've had a job or two or three and you have a 401k here and an IRA there, it makes sense to consolidate those into one because many times you can't. And again, that's where you go back to the financial advisor. It saves you fees uh, and you have the money in one place. That is different than putting all of your eggs in one basket. Okay. That is different. I'm not, you know, it doesn't make sense to have your money in three institutions and say you're diversifying your portfolio, it makes sense to have it in one spot so it's easy to manage, and then you diversify with that one, with that one portfolio. And I would also review other documents, uh, powers of attorney for healthcare and property. I will tell you, in the real world, we do have problems when it comes to using a durable power of attorney for property that is more than one year old. Now, before you hear this and freak out, that is not all instances. But we do get pushback from many institutions if you seek to use this durable power of attorney uh, when typically when someone's become incapacitated. Lastly, if you have grandkids, consider a 529 for your grandkids. If you're a grandparent and you put money into a 529 for a grandchild, that is not counted against the grandchild on the FAFSA, which is the um, sort of the one, the, the financial aid application that every college student does that is not counted against the, the grandchildren. It is if the parent does it. Okay. So a 529 for grandkids, uh, you know, anyone who's watching this obviously values uh, uh, education. So Brent asks, I'm considering starting 
a charitable remainder trust uh, this year or next year. Can you suggest any thoughts around what rules might be changing and strategies one sh should consider? Uh, does a gift tax ever apply to property put into a CRT? Yeah, Brent, you know, I, I would say the, the, the Build Back Better Act, a BBBA, we're using the acronym, uh, that makes no change to the charitable trust. Sometimes there is a taxable gift. It depends on who the beneficiary of the charitable trust is. And that's something we can certainly talk about one-on-one. -on -one. We do have a separate webinar on our YouTube page, and I would really suggest that you take a look at that on charitable trusts. We do have a lot of content coming out uh, next quarter on charitable trusts as well. So uh, what does a 1035 policy mean, please? I'm sorry, a 1031 is a tax deferred exchange for real property. A 1035 is a tax deferred exchange of a life insurance policy. So you don't pull the money out of the life insurance policy and go buy a new one, but you can effectuate a tax deferred exchange. Anonymous, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, can you designate a living trust as POD, TOD? What are the pros and cons of designating the revocable trust as POD or TOD? Uh, anonymous, that is the lazy person's way of funding a trust. So uh, sometimes an institution will say, oh, don't put it in your trust because they don't want to fill out the paperwork. They say, we'll just name your trust as payable and death beneficiary. Here is the problem. There is something in California called an order of liquidation. So if you have a, if you have a bank account in your own name and a POD account and a living trust, there's a sequencing of which money has to come out of what bucket first. And you can easily mess that up and be liable to beneficiaries. So I would say best practices, best estate planning hygiene is to put all those things in your living trust that should be put in the living trust. That would be your bank account, your, your brokerage account, your, um, your rental properties, your IRAs, annuities, 401ks, 403bs, TSAs, life insurance stays outside of the trust. Um, but I would say a POD, you know, internally as lawyers, we say it's kind of the lazy person's way of, of funding a trust. So I, I wouldn't rely on it. All right. So what is the current status of the Biden Build Back Better plan? What is it? It keeps changing. So <laughs> I did this very recently, but here is the bottom line. There will be, if this passes, for Californians, a 62.1% income tax rate. Uh, and that will affect, frankly, it will affect a lot of people. And as we go through this, you'll see, oh my goodness, I didn't realize, but that might affect me. So there are a lot of changes. And what these are, I kind of feel like, I don't know if you get the sense. You know, I watch the news and I watch all these different proposals come out. It's, it's like when you make spaghetti and you know it's done when it sticks to the wall. I kind of feel like everyone's like in the kitchen making spaghetti and they're just throwing the spaghetti on the wall. And one of these is going to hit. One of these is going to stick. So I have no idea what's going to happen, but I can tell you where we're at right now. Okay. Um, so is the sky falling? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I will tell you though, I talked to a lot of advisors and we are really struggling what to tell our clients. And I'm just, I'm going to, you know, sort of bare my soul to you. Um, I have no idea how these pieces might fit together because we don't know what the rules are going to be. It's very frustrating as a practitioner for, for, for me and for my colleagues to, what do we say to our clients? What do we tell them? You know, we had very recently, as we record this, we're, we're on a Thursday, Tuesday, there was an election. The Republican governor won in Virginia and the Democrat candidate in New Jersey barely made it into office. And how does that going to work? And now what I'm hearing is Democrats are saying, okay, we really need to get this through to strengthen our position. I say this in a completely, a completely apolitical sense, because I'm just trying to figure out what taxes are going to be next year. Okay. Um, so who's affected by this Build Back Better Act, which is the House Resolution 5376? Uh, who's affected? Okay. Uh, Anonymous asks, the best practice is, it, is the best practice to designate in your revocable living trust or designate your living trust the beneficiary of your life insurance policy? You know, I would say for many people it can be, but something to understand, if you designate your life insurance the beneficiary, if you designate your living trust the beneficiary of your life insurance policies, your creditors when you die could potentially get that life insurance policy. So I would say if you're a pilot, you know, you might want to think twice before you name your living trust the beneficiary of your life insurance policy, because if you die flying, uh, you might have a passenger, 
and you know that's not not as good for your family. So, um, but I would say it's case specific. But in general, most people leave the living trust uh, the beneficiary of their life insurance policy. All right, um, you know Biden thought he had consensus with the Democrats and um, to pass the infrastructure bill. That didn't, you know, that's kind of in limbo. And I will say there is doubt about anything getting passed, but it is looking likely that that this will get through. I'm I'm just saying what it you know, maybe 60, 40, 50, 50, but I'm kind of preparing that it might go through because we have to be prepared, right? But I would say that on a very high level, the focus has shifted from death taxes and wealth taxes to income taxes. And I've been saying this for a long time. What I've been saying for a long time is the de death taxes were cut. And I always thought, well, income taxes are going to have to go up because the government doesn't want to wait until people die, right? They want that money now, this year, next year, okay? So one of the cornerstones of, of this Build Back Better uh, Act is expansion of this little known tax called the net investment income tax. And if you've never heard of that, you really need to familiarize, with, familiarize yourself with it because it's an added 3.8% uh, tax on, on income. Now, what they're proposing, what you'll see in the headline is, oh, if you make more than 10 million a year, you got to pay another 5% tax. And if you make more than 25 million a year, you have to pay an extra three. So what they're not seeing, what, you know, what, what you're not seeing is significantly uh, lower income thresholds for trusts, meaning it's not 10 million and it's not 25 million, it's 200,000. And as you see, as we go through this, it's very important this is yet another reason if you have an AB trust, if you have an AB living trust, that B trust might be a really bad idea, okay? Because these extra taxes not only apply to income, but they apply to capital gains as well. And we'll talk about if you have a B trust, and we'll explain what that is, you could have significantly higher income taxes and you may not know it. So you may think, oh, well, I'll sell it and I'll pay capital gains at this, at this rate, but then you got to slap on another 8% from 20 to 28 federal, okay? Plus three and a half. So you might be going from 20 to 31.8. We'll talk about that. Also closing the loopholes for foreign uh, companies, which, you know, we're, that's really not something our, our firm has focused on with, with our clients, just, just for a variety of reasons and limitations on business write-offs. So something to understand about the net investment income tax is this is essentially the Medicare tax. So when you, if you're a W-2 earner, you say, oh man, that Medicare tax, right? That's that 3.8% that you're paying. Essentially what the government's trying to do is they're trying to, to broaden application of this 3.8% Medicare tax. It's designed to pay, it's designed to fund Medicare, okay? Currently what people do is, and many of our clients do this, they have an S-Corp. And, uh, and we have an a a example here. Uh, Bob's a baker. And he works in a, he owns a bakery. He works in the bakery. Uh, the, the baker, the, the bakery is held by an S corporation. Okay. So the S corporation runs the business. Bob is an employee of the S corporation and takes a hundred thousand dollars salary. He also takes another $900,000 in dividends. Now the S corp, it's a, it's a classification of corporation. S corp is a small corporation. A C corp is a big corporation like Apple. So what we're talking about is small corporations. And Bob takes sal a salary of 100,000 and takes dividends of 900,000. Well, he's able to bypass $22,800 a year in Medicare tax on those $900,000 in distributions. Okay. So, but if the law, if it passes, he will only be saving in this example, in this case study, he'll only be saving $11,000. Okay. So uh, he, well, I'm sorry, he would have been saving 34,200 with this structure where he takes 900,000 as a dividend. But under the new law, he would be uh, get a haircut and only have an eleven thousand four hundred dollar savings, right? So he's getting that he's paying twenty two thousand eight hundred more in tax. Um, in the B trust, is the trust created after the passing of the spouse? Yes, it is. We'll we'll cover that in a little bit. So uh, I would say on a high level, if you're a business owner, if you have an S corp, if you're taking dividends and you're playing that game, uh, you're going to see a limitation on that if this thing passes. Okay, so. For trusts, this is very important. This is not a living trust. If you have a living trust, I'm not talking about your living trust. This is if you have a B trust. So if your spouse has died and this B trust is in existence and it has assets in it, all undistributed income from non-grantor trusts 
all income would be taxed an additional 3.8%. Across the board, 3.8% uh, increase in income taxes. Now this includes B trusts and dynasty trusts. So a B trust would be, you know, husband and wife have a living trust, uh, an older living trust, husband dies, wife survives, husband's half of the property goes to the B trust. Any income that is not distributed to the wife, the surviving spouse, is taxed at a much higher rate. Sometimes income's distributed, sometimes it's not. We'll see, there's a nuance here with capital gain. Please bear with me, because this is very important. And this is why, if you have a living trust, you really need to know what, how this thing's written, because a B trust may be, not only is it a pain in the neck when a spouse dies, it may be of no utility in your family, and it actually may cause you to pay higher taxes, all right? Um, and somebody asks, is it better not to have a B trust when a spouse passes? Maybe, maybe. I would say for 99.7% of the population, the answer is yes. But if you're in the 0.3% of the population, maybe not. So undistributed net income of amounts of over 13,000, you are in the highest tax bracket. And if you're in California and you have this 3.8% net investment income tax, that is 53%. Is a living trust the same as a revocable trust? A revocable trust, yes. Currently, the 3.8% net investment income tax only applies to passive investments, interest, dividends, stock income. But this bill proposes to levy it across the board, okay? Big difference. So what do you do now? Well, if you're forming an S corporation this year, probably not many of you have, are thinking about, I mean, you might be thinking about it. You may wanna pump the brakes a little bit and wait and see what happens because you may not want an S-corp election. Now, all that S-corp election means is tax is not paid at the corporate rate, like at Apple, right? They pay a corporate tax and then they may have a dividend. An S-corp, there's no tax paid and all that flows through to the owner of the S-corp shares, okay? But those are smaller corporations. Um, consider maybe instead of being an S-corp, maybe you're a partnership uh, or maybe you're a C-corp. There are a lot of advantages to both of those. And, you know, if, if this ability to bypass this 3.8% Medicare tax effectively goes away, I can tell you, as a practitioner, I'm going to be looking at, at partnership structures and C-corp structures for, for clients. Uh, because, you know, the higher the taxes go, this is just a numbers game, right? I mean, it's not, it's not what you, you make, it's what you keep. And if you can do things, structure them differently and keep more money in your pocket, that, that makes economic sense. Uh, but you can't be, you can't late file your form, um, your, your S corp election, because it can, it's only permitted if it's inadvertent, not intentional. So that's a dicey one. And this is something you're going to want to do in concert with your CPA and your, typically this is the CPA and the lawyer that, that make these decisions. Um, let's see, we have another question. Uh, how would you, how would that apply to an LLC? An LLC can be taxed either as a corporation or a partnership. So you have, or disregarded entity. So you have, um, you have an ability to choose uh, how you want to be taxed. I will say on a high level, if an LLC owns real estate, it is typically taxed as a partnership or a disregarded entity. And if an LLC is running a business, many times that's taxed as an S-corp, sometimes a disregarded entity, many times an S-corp, it just depends. Um, so... We have, uh, so what should, be, what should you be doing now? Well, you need to understand if you're the trustee of a trust that's a non-grantor trust. Now, what a non-grantor trust is, that's just a tax term. It means a living trust and someone's died, okay? Uh, or it, mean, it means a trust that has to file its own tax return. Uh, it means a trust that is taxable as a trust, okay? Now, it, just bear with me on that. Here's something you need to understand, though. Net investment income tax applies to undistributed income of a trust and estates with no threshold limitation. Again, the first dollar you're going to pay 3.8% does not apply to living trusts, but it applies once your living trust is irrevocable. You can avoid the application of the net investment income tax if you pay that income out to the, the beneficiary, okay? Income. We're going to talk about capital gain and how that's treated slightly differently. But you need to think about tax bracket arbitrage. As a general rule, 
if it, an example of, is a B trust and a dynasty trust. So this is really important. If you have a B trust, if you have a generation skipping trust, a lot of our clients do, a lot of our clients' parents set these up for them. If you have a dynasty trust, your tax bill may be going up if you don't pay attention to this, okay, and work with your A team. Tax bracket arbitrage, all that means is if you pay money, if you make a distribution to beneficiaries, it's taxed at their low rate. If you retain that in the trust and don't distribute it, it is taxed at the higher trust rates, okay? Now there's a term, simple complex. All a complex trust means, and I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but this is, this is important stuff. A complex trust is a trust where someone's died, typically, uh, or someone's made a gift, and the trustee has the discretion to withhold payments of income. So if the trustee is mandated to distribute income to the beneficiary, that is called the simple trust because it's simple. You, get, you make money on investments, you must distribute the income to the beneficiary. A complex trust gives the trustee discretion. Most trusts that I see are complex trusts, okay? Most trusts that I see where some, there's a B trust or whatever it is, most of them are complex because it gives you more planning flexibility, okay? Um, so something to understand, if you, and, and we have an example on the next page, if you own a business and your spouse has died and the assets of that business have ended up in a B trust, you are taxed at the highest rates, no matter what the amount of the income is. And so we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So if you own, this is something very important. If you own any S corp stock in a B trust, in a dynasty trust, in a generation skipping trust, uh, you have to number one, verify you have appropriate language to keep your small business trust compliance. And this electing a small business trust means you have a trust that owns S corp shares. Okay. And if you don't have the right language in there, you're going to have a real problem. Now we'll say most trusts have that language, but if you don't have it, we have seen some that don't have it, you're gonna be in trouble. But if you have S Corp stock and you've got an irrevocable trust, you really need to check in with your advisors, your CPA and your lawyer. You don't necessarily need to understand it, but just go, yeah, my spouse passed away and we still have that business and we have that B trust. Oh my gosh, I need to talk to my CPA and my lawyer to make sure that's correct, okay? So to fix this, um, what we do when, this is kind of a workaround, when somebody dies and you have a family-owned business and some of those S-Corp shares end up in your, your B trust, okay? A lot of times the beneficiaries will simply buy those, okay? So it's, that's convenient because then it gets it into an individual's name instead of a trust name and, and the taxes are lower, okay? So I don't want to belabor this point, but um, understand that the, the difference is a, an individual avoids net investment income tax on income under four or 500 if you're filing single or jointly. Four and 500, if it's in your trust, you're going to pay that extra 3.8% tax. You know, and it could be 10 grand. I mean, it could be not a small amount of money. Um, so let's look at Hal and Wanda. Hal and Wanda own a boat yard and it operates as an S Corp and it kicks off 400,000 a year in income. Hal dies. Hal and Wanda haven't looked at their trust since 1995. They have an AB trust requires Hal's half of the property, including Hal's S Corp shares to, be, to go into the B trust because Hal and Wanda never updated their trust. The taxes on the 200,000 in income are taxed at the highest rates, which is 54.1%. That's if the BBA passes, the Build Back Better Act passes, okay? So I would say, pay attention. If you have S Corp stock in a B trust or you know someone who does, and you, you might know this because typically it's going to be spouses and one spouse passes away and you have a survivor um, and you still have the business, um, you know, you could be looking at a significantly higher tax bill. So don't be fooled by the, you'll see a 15 and $25 million number and think that doesn't apply to you. Uh, it, it can, it depends, right? Um, and I, we really recommend that you assemble your A-team. Uh, does NIT apply to special needs trust? Yes. NIT is a complex trust, right? Is it better to distribute the beneficiary rather than through the trust to avoid the 3.8% tax? Yes, that's what we're talking about, anonymous. So it's something to consider. We'll talk about capital gains in a little bit. And then uh, how do I get a copy of your slides? I believe, uh, Kim, we can certainly post those on our, on our, um, on our YouTube channel when, when we're done with this. So who's your A-team? What is an A-team? 
Well, this is your A team. Well, this is the A team, the show from the 80s. But your A team is going to be a savvy lawyer, your expert CPA, a financial advisor. And I would really recommend that you consider a financial advisor who is a fiduciary. And that is, I would say, a trend that's happening in the financial services industry. All a fiduciary means is they have to put your interests before theirs. Not all financial, financial advisors are fiduciaries. I would also recommend um, there's some other members of the A team, depending on your situation, a realtor, insurance professional, spiritual advisor. You know, um, uh, these are weighty topics. You know, we're talking about death. We're talking about, um, you know, your legacy here on earth when you, when you depart this earth. Um, and these are non-financial considerations, but for some people, they do want a spiritual advisor uh, as well. And Anne-Marie asked, does it look like the doing away with step up and basis on death is in this bill? No, there's no, uh, no, that's not in there and we'll cover, I'm going to go through a laundry list of what's not in here. Uh, is, does the 3.8% apply to amounts more than 400,000 in the trust? No, it applies on the first dollar with no minimum threshold. Okay, so this is something to understand. This is the latest piece of spaghetti that's getting thrown up on the wall, okay? Let's add 3.8% income tax on pretty much everything we can get away with, okay? That's where it's going. That, that's, that's the kind of the takeaway from this, all right? Assemble your A-team. You should think about having an A-team. It really doesn't matter if you're rich or not rich or going to be rich in the future. You know, you got to have a team because this stuff is too hard. It's too complex. And you know what? These four guys, guess what? They talk. Your advisors, they need to communicate. And I tell clients, you know, your advisors need to have their, each other's cell phone and be able to call on a Saturday. Okay. They need to be working that closely together because many times these rule changes go down so fast. We can't be dealing with, you know, voicemail and email and, and, and the, the gatekeepers on the advisors. Um, but really get, get your A team together. And I will tell you as people, as people age, their advisors retire. And so it's kind of hard because these guys uh, sometimes, you know, you have to replace them. Is the 1031 exchange going away? No, it's not, it's not on the table. What's the minimum tax for the living trust after the living trust becomes uh, an irrevocable trust? The minimum tax, it starts very low. You hit the highest rates right around 13,000 in income. So I would say on a very low amount, you're going to be at your marginal, your top tax rate. S-corp income is always taxed at the highest rate. Um, so A-team, our firm, we have a family office practice. So this is typically skewed for higher net worth people. But that's something we offer our clients. So our clients were going to be coming up on that season in January, February, where our clients decide, oh yeah, let's 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 hire um, you know Cunningham Legal to um, run our family office. And what that is is that's a whole. And we kind of explain on our website, that's a whole host of services to make sure that uh, your estate, your estate, and your tax situation is optimized. And frankly, this does require for many clients ongoing annual. Uh, care and feeding, for lack of a better term, right? Uh, whatever, whatever that care and feeding is. Here's our website. Go ahead and check that out right there. Uh, we have the high net worth right in the middle of the, the pages, the high net worth, uh, you know, consider a family office. And so that kind of starts at 10 million. For most people, it's about 30 and up, but um, it's something to take a look at because, you know, this is something that whether you choose to hire advisors or not, you can at least be paying attention and educating yourself uh, on, on YouTube, frankly, uh, is it possible to get rid of a B trust after it's irrevocable? Yes. Anonymous. Um, many times that does require a court order. And so we, we do that regularly. We're probably doing, I think the last time we counted them, we did, I don't know, 55 or 60 in, in a given year. I think that was in 2019. Um, so anonymous asks with low income tax rate, 13,000 for an irrevocable trust, uh, Tell how much amount 13 applicable, what are the other rates? Well, at 13,000, the federal rate is 37%. It's the maximum rate. This is for undistributed income, okay? We're going to talk about capital gains because that actually is, I would say probably in, in the real world, those are the biggest tax problems when it comes to irrevocable trusts is, is the capital gain. And, and, and I'm going to walk you through this. So if passed, the Build Back Better Act adds a $5 surtax, sur meaning, you know, top of surtax. So it goes five additional tax on tax pay, on tax, um, 
on amounts over 10 million. So over 10 million in income, this includes capital gain, okay? Includes capital gain. And on trust or estate income over 200,000 per trust or per estate, this 5% will apply. Now think about that. If you have a rental property in a B trust and you do a 1031 exchange, which is the tax deferred exchange, and for some reason you don't buy a replacement property and you have to realize a capital gain, the marginal rates in California are 37.1%. You're going to add 5% to that. Okay. So this is a pretty big tax increase. And I would say this is a rather secret. Um, this one, people won't pay a lot of attention to this. So this will fly under the radar, kind of like Prop 19 flew under the radar. And then you're going to get hit with a significantly higher tax bill and you're going to be really surprised. So this is something to pay attention to. So what we're talking about again, and this is yet another reason why a B trust is, is, can, can be a really bad idea, is the taxes are going up on those. And it's not 10 million, it's not 20 million, it's 200,000. It's really, really low. So Helen wanted to sell their business for 20 million. They'll be subject to an additional tax of 500,000. You might say, oh, boo hoo. You know, they got sold their company for 20 million. But uh, there are a lot of people out there selling their businesses for eight, 10, 20. We had another client sell their, client, their business for over 100 million. And this is just an additional tax that you're going to have to pay. So Hal and Wanda uh, don't, uh, the Hal and Wanda die and fail to properly plan for Hal's $500,000 IRA. Okay. There'll be an extra $9,000 in income tax attributable to Hal's estate on top of the 37% federal. What I mean by that is this is if Hal's IRA ends up in his estate. Let's say he doesn't pay attention to his beneficiary designation. He names Wanda and then Wanda dies, then Hal dies. Well, that money's going to go to his, likely going to go to his probate estate and the taxes are going to be $9,000 more. Okay. Uh, minimum federal income tax rate is 37 for irrevocable trust, question mark. No, that kicks in at $13,050. Uh, and 37% is the, the maximum. There are brackets, but the brackets are compressed. So the, those, those federal tax brackets, you know, it, it takes 500,000 in income or more to get to 37,000. Those are compressed down to $13,050, okay? So you've got some, some compression of the, of the rates. Now, and then there's an extra 3%. Remember, five plus three is eight, okay? There's another 3% on income over 25 million uh, or 12.5 million if you're married filing separately. So if your income, if the trust and estate can, income is over 500,000, there's an extra 3% tax. So it's 37 plus five plus three plus 3.8% plus state taxes. That's how we get to 62.1, okay? And this tax applies on ordinary income and capital gain, okay? So this applies in capital gain and is not decreased by charitable deductions, okay? Or any itemized deductions. So that's an, another important. So how long want to sell their business and they're subject to these higher rates? 3.8 plus five plus three means the tax rates increase 11.8% or by 11.8% on top of the 37 and 13.3. That's how I get to the 62.1. Your A team should be at the ready with several strategies. And what a lot of my clients are looking at now, we had a question on it, use, use of a charitable trust. There's also something called an installment sale. That's where you say, you know what? Uh, instead of selling, you know, I'm gonna sell you my thing for $10, $10 million, my business for 10 million, you pay this third party and they'll pay me a million dollars a year. Well, you spread that out over, over a 10 year period. That's what an installment sale. So a third party is paying you. Certainly, the, the buyer can pay you, but uh, you, know, you, you may not want to trust the buyer to actually pay you. And then there are tax credit strategies, uh, including solar and other strategies. And you know, I, I would say that the job of the A-team is to look at the data as appropriate. And for some of our clients, we're looking at it quarterly. But look at the data. And many times, the A-team can, can discover significant tax credit and savings and deduction and deferral opportunities for you and your family. Uh, and, and for the causes that you care about. So a lot of our clients are charitable and they can use some charitable strategies to defer the taxes uh, and basically send less money to the government uh, or send the money to the government later. And so you have the time value of money, get the use of the money, it's kind of like a free loan. But let's take a closer look at the trust and estates. Um, you know, this is the, if your income's over $200,000 $200, problem. This is a big problem. 
So living trusts are not separately taxed. Living trusts are what are called a grantor trust, meaning you're the grantor, you're the creator of the trust, you set the trust up, you are deemed the taxpayer. You can also do that with an irrevocable trust, which a lot of our clients do. That's a very powerful strategy for wealthy families. We are not talking about those trusts. We are talking about trusts like you pass away and you set up this dynasty trust for your kids, okay? Or you set up a, um, a, there's a B trust after a spouse passes away. I think this B trust is going to be like the biggest space that this is going to occupy because this is what I see the most in, in practice. Many clients have a legacy B trust, okay? This 5% tax applies to all trust income over 200,000, including capital gain. Now, something that, I mean, I, I hate to throw the technical stuff at you, but if your A team has no idea what distributable net income is, that is a big problem, okay? So typically people view income as, oh, I put money in the bank and I get, in, you know, <clears throat> I get interest, maybe a little bit. That interest is income. The, uh, the amount in the, in, in the bank is principal. If I have a stock and I pay $10 for that stock and that stock pays me a dividend, the dividend is income. However, sometimes if that stock goes from 10 to $15 and there's a $5 capital gain, Many states, but not all, many states let you treat that, that capital gain as income. And this is where distributable net income comes in. And this is why it's very important. Sometimes a capital gain is deemed income. Right? Now, typically it's not, but if, you're, if state law allows it and the trust document allows it, so this, this, this solves this too. Oh my gosh, our capital gains over 200,000. We're going to have to pay this extra tax, this extra. 5% plus 3% plus 3.8%. That's a lot of money, 11.8% extra tax. If that's distributed to the individual beneficiary, they very well, very well not pay, may pay any of that tax, right? Any of that extra tax. So this is about mindfulness, about trust. This is why you need an expert. This is why you can't go to a generalist. And you really do need to pay attention to this. And I will tell you, if you're a member of, an, of, of if you're on the A team for somebody else, and you're one of those advisors, you need to understand the concept of distributable net income. It's a really, really big deal. Because a trust, by the way, a trust, if it distributes the income, doesn't pay tax on it. So essentially, it's a deducted, right? So if your trustee is not paying attention, and it does happen, and doesn't dis distribute the income over 200, or maybe you know, the, where that trust is located or the trust itself does not permit a distribution of capital gain, which is a problem, okay, can be a problem, uh, then there's, a, there's an, this potential additional tax, okay? So if your A-team isn't in place working with your trustee and the beneficiaries, uh, the trustee may be overpaying tax. And if you're the trustee, guess what? You're 100% personally liable for that. So that is, a, that is an ugly place to be as a trustee. So this is why if you're choosing to be a trustee, very important that you pay attention to this. It's very important that you get competent legal counsel and competent um, California or competent legal counsel, competent tax compliance counsel. Does California or Texas consider capital gains as DNI? California does. Most states do. Uh, but again, this is an election, Chuck. It's an election that you're going to make, and the trust document has to permit it. Is it good to distribute to the beneficiary uh, more than two hundred thousand to save on taxes? In this case, in this case study, yes. Here's the problem: What if it's a, a beneficiary with special needs? Yeah, you're going to have you know. This is going to be an issue. You got to pay attention to this. Carol says, I came in late. Will this webinar be repeated at a later date? Carol, this is going to be recorded. It's going to be on YouTube in a couple hours. And um, so this is the principle, the Uniform Principle and Income Act. If this Principle and Income Act has been adopted by the laws of the state that govern the trust, you have more flexibility. If it does not, you don't have that flexibility. This is why it's very important to choose, have a mindful choice of the state. California does permit this. Not all states do, okay? But the key concept, you know, I know I'm talking a, a lot of technical stuff. The big rock issue, you know, they're big rocks and they're little rocks and they're little grains of sand. Those are the details. The big rock issue is understand that capital gains in this type of irrevocable trust, you may have, you may have to pay a lot more tax than you're thinking in your mind and if you're the trustee, you may inadvertently really screw this up, okay? So you need competent counsel. This is not a do-it-yourself project. 
please pay attention to this, okay? Uh, and let's go over the other components of the Build Back Better Act. Uh, the qualified small business stock, there is currently 100% gain exclusion. Now they're going to throttle that back to 50% if your income's over 4,000. This actually affects a fair amount of our clients, uh, and this would be bad news. Cryptocurrency, this is a big change. A lot of our clients have crypto. A lot of our clients have made a killing on crypto, okay? Crypto's gone way up. They're going to make crypto, if this passes, subject to the constructive sale and the wash sale rules. So what that means is if, you, if your crypto's gone way up and you effectively want to short the crypto, so if it goes down, you're made whole, uh, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> okay, you're not going to be able to do that. So if, if you're thinking about that, you might want to do that this year. Think about doing it this year. And if you have a loss, you can harvest that loss. So if you Right, right. If you if you paid up here for the crypto and it goes down, you can sell that and essentially simultaneously buy it back, and realize that loss without being subject to the wash sale rules. So kind of technical, but just understand if you're a crypto person, uh, and again, you know, if you're if you have crypto and you don't know this, you you're really not going to find out. You know, if you do this on January second, you're probably not going to find out till the following year, in 2023, when you're doing your 2022 taxes. You're like, oh man, I got to pay more tax. That's ridiculous. All right, so other components of the Build Back Better Act are the 15% minimum tax for large corporations. It's been in the news quite a bit. Uh, when President Biden was, was abroad in Scotland, it looks like that they came to a, a multilateral agreement on that. The 21% rate remains for C-Corps. Corporate, corporate tax is not going up. No change in the SALT cap, it's still 10,000, the state and local tax cap. So if you itemize your deductions, um, you know, that, that's not great news. I know a lot of the, the blue state senators were and, and members of Congress were trying to get that back. But as it's written right now, status is no salt cap, no change in the salt cap, no increase in the personal income tax rate, except for the surtax, right? The three and the five and the 3.8. So they're kind of, so this personal income tax rate, there's no increase in that 37% to 39.6, but there are these extra taxes. No increase in the capital gains tax rate, but again, net investment income taxes is broadened and we still have these surtaxes. No increase in the death tax. So no, no elimination of the Trump era extra $5 million uh, death tax exemption. And you know, I look at that as, as, a, uh, as like a layered cake. So you have your 2011 Obama exemption of 5 million plus an inflation adjustment. And then you have the Trump era 5 million, which is like frosting on the cake. If you make a gift of 5 million, you are making it from the Obama cake, the older exemption, the 2011 exemption, not the Trump frosting, the 2017 exemption. So in order to get traction, to get meaningful traction, our clients really should be considering giving more than 5 million. Okay, we're more than 6.7 million now. And uh, no elimination of grantor trust. That was everyone, all the practitioners were quaking in their boots. Elimination of grantor trust. Uh, net, investment, net investment income taxes are for capital gain. Uh, and this is a question. Net investment income taxes are for capital, are only for capital gains? No, it's uh, investment income. So um, as a net investment income tax, so it's any investment income that is uh, passive in nature, and they're looking to kind of make that 3.8% significantly broader. Okay, no elimination of fractional interest discounts for lack of marketability and lack of control. The bottom line is, if you're a wealthy individual, you can give about $18 million in property in real estate and only use $11.7 million of exemption because you, if it's done right, you can get what's called a discounted valuation. No elimination of qualified personal residence trusts. Those are trusts that wealthy people use for residences to minimize taxes. Uh, no change, no elimination of grantor charitable lead annuity trust. So there's no change in the charitable trust. Grantor retained annuity trust. It's also known as a GRAT. There's no change in that. No elimination of adjusted cost basis at death. This is not in this bill. This build back better. Now, can it get thrown in? I have no idea. But this is as of, you know, very recently, and no forced liquidation of mega iris. We covered that in a previous webinar. That was kind of, again, this is kind of the spaghetti that's getting thrown on the wall. And, uh, you know, a lot of spaghetti's fallen off and, and some of it's going to stick, right? If it passes. 
And um, no change in the 199A, 20% income tax deduction for qualified business income. You know, I would say the tax code favors business owners and the tax code code punishes W-2 earners. So if you're a business owner, you have more, as a, on a very high level, you have a more favorable income tax treatment. If you're solely a W-2 earner, you have a less favorable tax treatment. Uh, anonymous asks, no cost basis for stocks or personal home. Uh, no, no change in the, the adjusted cost basis at death rule. That's correct. And finally, there are fewer changes than anticipated. Uh, who knows what's going to be in the bill? This guy, this is Joe Manchin, Senator from West Virginia. He seems to control the Senate. Uh, maybe there's the uh, cinema from, from Arizona, but these two people are very vocal and uh, are really, you know, in my observation, driving policy. You should pay attention. Pay attention to this because we're getting close to the end of the year and there's some gotchas in there. And if you can, you know, if it's better to sell something in December versus January and you don't find out till December 18th, you don't have much time, right? You need to pay attention to this and you need to have that A team assembled. And I, I know it's a, I'm beating this A team drum. You really need to have the people who are looking out for you, your crew, you need to have that, that team assembled in advance. It's very difficult to assemble it, you know, 10 days before the end of the year when you have to do some really deep analytics and figure out which direction you should go. So if you'd like to make an appointment with our firm, go to our website, cunninghamlegal.com. You can request an appointment and, and, uh, also, sign up for one of our webinars. If you're watching this on YouTube, go to our, our website, click the link in, our, in our, um, our description here, and that'll take you to the webinar page. And go ahead and register for a webinar because these are very timely. I work on these very close in time to when, um, when we have them. So this, this is really up-to-the-date uh, information. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the button, subscribe. It's really easy. And then this will pop up in your YouTube feed. And if you enjoy our webinars, Review us on Google. So we have a, a number of locations and go to uh, any location and give us a review on Google. That would be very helpful. So I'll open it up for questions. We just have a couple more minutes. Anonymous asks, okay, there is no change in the cost basis question. So I would really encourage you, uh, go ahead and take a look. If you're watching this on YouTube, we have a lot of other uh, videos on there that cover a broad variety of topics. And we have a... Um, uh, you know, this change in the law that's going to happen really soon. So please pay attention to that. Seek out your A team. And it's very important that you have competent advisors who talk to each other and have your best interests at heart. And so with that, it doesn't look like we have any other further questions. I wish you well, have a great day, and we look forward to seeing you soon.